Subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon so that you know when live we go. Hello and welcome to Rao's IAS DNS session. We are going to have a discussion on today's newspaper, The Hindu, Delhi edition dated 21st February 2022. We shall pick up articles important for civil service examination and discuss them as per the demand of the exam. There is an article on page number 10, very few buses accessible to differently abled. Recently, Government of India has put out some data in Raj Sabha as an answer to the question posed in the House concerning the progress of Accessible India campaign. According to the data given out by Social Justice and Empowerment Ministry, 48.5% of government buildings, both central and state governments, have been made accessible. The target was of 50%. So the target has been almost achieved, although after pushing up the deadline twice. Accessible India campaign was launched in 2015, was to be finished off in 2018. But then it was extended once and then it was extended twice and the final deadline is June 2022. However, the target concerning making transportation accessible and in particular 25% of public buses to be made accessible, that has not been achieved to a considerable extent. Only around 8% of public buses have become fully accessible under Accessible India campaign. But achievement in terms of build infrastructure, in terms of airports, railway stations, that has been impressive. And you yourself must have observed this while traveling to the airports and railway stations. There are translators, there are escalators, there are lifts. Even in metro stations, accessibility has been improved. In all 35 international airports and all A and B category railway stations, Accessibility features have been made available. The union government also has launched 95 websites accessible to differently abled. There are three categories in which accessibility generally are seen in terms of build infrastructure. So in terms of government buildings, airports, railway stations, in terms of public infrastructure. Accessibility is also seen in terms of public transportation. And thirdly, in terms of ICT infrastructure. So although in terms of build infrastructure, the target has been good, rather very impressive. But in terms of public transportation and ICT, it hasn't been very impressive. Let's now have a general discussion on Accessible India campaign. Accessible India campaign, also alternatively called as Sugamya Bharat Abhiyan, it's a nationwide campaign launched in 2015. The purpose is to achieve universal accessibility for persons with disabilities, the differently able people. Since the Department of Empowerment of Persons with Disabilities is the nodal agency for most of the programs and initiatives for differently abled people, so this is also the nodal agency under Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment to look after the progress of Accessible India campaign. As we have discussed, there are three verticals for the implementation of this campaign. One is the build infrastructure, the building's public places infrastructure. And it is also the case that improving the building infrastructure benefits everyone. It's not just the differently abled people. It helps elderly, it helps people using skates, it helps people using trolleys, it helps in rolling the cradle. The infrastructure useful for differently abled people are useful in general. The second vertical of the campaign is to have the transportation sector accessible. Transportation is vital component for independent living. And just like other people in society, differently abled people also use transportation for their movement. So accessible transportation is a marker, indicator for freedom, indicator for liberty, indicator of right to movement. The third vertical is ICT ecosystem. You know that information is power and access to information creates opportunities for everyone in society. People use information in many forms to make decisions about their daily lives. And this can range from simple reading of price tag, to physically enter a hall, to participate in an event, to read a pamphlet with healthcare information, or to understand a train timetable, or to view web pages. So societal barriers of infrastructure in accessible formats stands in the way of obtaining and utilizing information in daily life. Supreme Court also has observed on multiple occasions that access to internet, access to social media enables the realization of right to life. So the overall vision of Accessible India campaign is to create a barrier-free environment for independent, safe and dignified living 
for differently abled people. Accessible India campaign has drawn inspiration from United Nations Convention on Rights for Persons with Disabilities, to which India is a signatory. And the action plan and targets of Accessible India campaign, they have been derived from goal 3 of intern strategy. This is pronounced as intern, it's a place in South Korea. Intern strategy. The intern strategy had 10 goals. It had goals like to reduce poverty and enhance work and employment prospects, promote participation in political progress, strengthen social protection, expand early intervention and education of children, ensuring gender equality, ensuring disability inclusive disaster risk reduction and management, improving the reliability and comparability of disability data, implementation of conventions on the rights of persons with disabilities, and advancing sub-regional, regional and inter-regional cooperation. The goal number three in this strategy is to enhance access to physical environment, public transportation, knowledge, information and communication. Once CRPD, this Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities came into force, Bivaco Millennium Framework and the Bivaco Plus 5 initiatives was formulated for inclusive, barrier-free, right-based society for persons with disabilities in Asia and Pacific region. And after that, intern strategy were formulated with specific goals. There are 10 goals in this. And this includes taking forward the vision of Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and the vision of Bivako Millennium Framework. So Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and Bivako Millennium Framework are precursors to intern strategy. Intern strategy itself is precursor to Beijing Declaration. Beijing Declaration basically was adapted to accelerate the implementation of the intern strategy. So it is the goal number three of the intern strategy which has formed the pillars of Accessible India campaign. But to give a legal cover to the campaign and a right to accessibility, Government of India enacted Rights for Persons with Disabilities Act 2016. This act came into force in 2017 and this formed the legal basis for the campaign. And with this, right to accessibility was not just a welfare measure by the welfare state, rather it was the matter of a right for the Vyanjan, for differently abled people. If you come to think about it as to why we should ensure access to differently abled people, you must realize that a disability is disabling only when it prevents someone from doing what they want or need to do. For example, a lawyer can just be as effective in a wheelchair as other lawyers if he or she has access to the courtroom and the legal libraries and whatsoever other places and materials and equipments as may be required by a lawyer. Even if a person can't hear, he could be very skilled artisan. He could be a very skilled chemist as well. Even a person with mental illness can nonetheless be a brilliant scholar or a theorist. You must have heard of John Nash. He was a subject of the movie A Beautiful Mind which you might have seen. John Nash was awarded Nobel Prize. He was one of the most important mathematicians of the second half of 20th century but he was suffering from schizophrenia. Despite that he bagged the Nobel Prize. You must have heard of Jim Abbott. He was born without a right hand but he had a 10 year pitching career in Major League Baseball. By definition, he had disability. But in reality, he has nothing of that kind. So when people with special needs are accommodated, their disabilities don't limit their ability to fully participate in the life. Disability is not disabling. Non-accommodation is. So we must ensure all kind of access to differently abled people. Right to dignified life is one of the most basic human right. Dignity is the most fundamental need of human beings. The core of the concept of the right which cannot be covered by some of all other rights is neutralizing the devastating isolation and loss of control over one's life. Discrimination, isolation, that takes away the core of the concept of rights. So to have a right-based society, accessibility is quintessential because people with disabilities, they have the same right as others. They are as much citizen of the state as others. They as much have dignity as human beings as others. 
So in the spirit of fairness and respect for human life, infrastructure of all kinds must be made accessible to all people. Because of their physical constraints, people with disabilities, they already have difficult life. So it's a simple human decency not to make people's life any harder. As a civilized society, it is our duty to help those in need. It is also said that the character of a man is judged by his conduct, his behavior towards people who are helpless, vulnerable, weak and people who can't give anything in return to him. The concept of a welfare state is based on principles like Antodaya. It is based on principles like trusteeship. Treating people in need according to their need is also portrayal of the value system of society. Value system of individuals, organizational values, national values. Differently able people add diversity to society. This diversity is enriching. If they can integrate into the community, they will have the opportunity to make more friends and more people will have the opportunity to know them. It is said that service to man is service to God. In this year, mains examination in the ethics paper, a quotation was given by UPSC of Eric Erickson. Life without interconnectedness does not make sense. In order to spiritually grow, one has to get into the service of others. Gandhiji has said that the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others. It is not about differently able people getting help. It is also about the spiritual rise of the rest of the community by helping them, by catering to their need, by accommodating them, by making the infrastructure of society accessible to them. Modern democracies have welfare nature, but fundamentally all government, whether democracy or otherwise, are under social contract. And to maintain the sanctity of that contract, the sovereign authority has to work for the welfare of all especially for the welfare of more vulnerable people. You must have heard the philosophy, the welfare of one is in the welfare of all. The welfare of all is in the welfare of most vulnerable. This is exactly the case here. Improving the accessibility for differently abled people improves the accessibility for everyone, including families with baby strollers, skateboarders, bicycle riders, for moving the trolley, for moving the rolling table, for any purpose, conveniently, the same infrastructure can be used. If you lower down the floor of the bus, it will not only help the differently able people, but it will help people in general. Translators, escalators, lifts, they are used not only by differently able people, but they are used by very healthy people as well. It generally improves the accessibility and generally helps everyone out. Failing to provide accessibility will actually waste a lot of talent. Stephen Hawking if he would not have been provided accessibility, ICT accessibility and otherwise, do you think so much of research work regarding black hole and others would have happened? John Nash, I gave you an example earlier. You must have umpteen number of examples where differently able people have shown that they have beautiful mind. Improving accessibility is also good business. It makes economic sense. For commercial operations of any kind, accessibility means that people with disabilities can become customers increasing sales volumes and profits. Moreover, if a firm is a good place for differently able customers to do business, their reputation, social capital also improves. And now, because of these reasons, a law has been legislated in India. So it is a legal mandate to provide accessibility. Now it has to be done because government now is accountable, not only morally, but legally too. But protecting and promoting the rights of differently able people is not just about providing services, making infrastructure accessible to them. It is also about adopting measures to change attitude and behavior that stigmatize and marginalize people with disabilities. It is also about having policies and laws and programs in place. The budgeting must also be done accordingly. Only then the civil, cultural, economic, political, social rights of differently abled people can be ensured. There is an article on page number 7, Polio Returns to Africa. There have been some cases of polio emerging not only in Africa but also in some Southeast Asian countries. This graph shows the cases year-wise in the African region. Recently, one case has been recorded in Malawi. But according to WHO, the case was imported from Pakistan. So this will not affect the polio virus free status of Africa. Africa has been declared polio free or to say polio has been eradicated in the region. 
for a country or a region to be declared polio free the wild transmission of all three kinds of polio virus has to be stopped it is not just the case of wild virus but also vaccine derived polio infection must also come to zero we will discuss in a short while what vaccine derived viruses are wild viruses are the one that naturally gives infection and they are present in nature naturally you must also be aware of the difference between eradication and elimination eradication of a disease refers to complete and permanent worldwide reduction to zero new cases so if a disease has been eradicated no further control measures are required however elimination of a disease refers to reduction to zero or a very low defined target rate of new cases and this very low number of target cases can be defined by the concerned organization for any specific geographical area so elimination of a disease will still require continued measures to prevent the reestablishment of disease you must be aware that india received polio free certification from who back in 2014 The last case registered in India was in 2011. Presently, only Afghanistan and Pakistan are the countries where the polio infection cases is still keep coming up. Polio is supposed to have been eradicated from rest of the world. If you talk about the polio virus, it is a positive sense single stranded RNA virus. There are three serotypes of wild polio virus they have been named as type 1 type 2 and type 3 there are slight variation in the outer caspid protein of these viruses and because of that variation you would understand by your knowledge of the outer layer of the coronavirus and the spike protein immunity to one serotype does not confer immunity to the other two but presently only type 1 polio virus remains type 2 was eradicated in 2015 and type 3 was declared eradicated in 2019 the polio virus can show various symptoms and infect a human being in various ways if the infection is in the central nervous system then there will be paralysis and this paralysis is irreversible it cannot be treated but infection of polio virus can also be outside the central nervous system and in those cases there are minor illness with mild symptoms so polio virus not necessarily will lead to paralysis actually less than 1% of polio virus infection results in paralysis the most common route for the spread of polio virus is through the fecal oral route when infected individuals they excrete into the open the virus sneaks into the environment and if the hygiene condition is not good it rapidly spreads throughout the community through the water the food intake polio virus affects mostly children under 5 years of age where immune system is not very robust once infection has happened it cannot be cured so prevention is the only cure you must know that polio virus enters through the mouth and multiplies in the intestine the present outbreak that has happened in some region of africa also in some region of southeast asia that is supposed to be happening because of circulating vaccine derived polio virus while circulating vaccine derived polio virus are rare they have been increasing in recent years due to low immunization rates within countries and within different region in a country african region was declared to have eradicated polio virus The region was declared to have interrupted transmission of wild polio virus in 2020. So the only way the polio virus is affecting the region is either the virus is coming from outside the region from Pakistan or Afghanistan or the current infections are because of circulating vaccine derived polio virus. The oral polio vaccine that we will discuss very shortly oral polio vaccine they have brought the wild polio virus to the brink of eradication. and they have had many benefits about which we will talk in a short while but oral polio vaccines they are live attenuated vaccine because they are live attenuated they provide better immunity in the gut and we have just seen that the polio virus multiplies in the intestine so better immunity in the gut helps fighting the virus better but the thing is that since it is live attenuated so the live virus can actually be excreted and where the sanitary conditions are poor the live virus coming out of stool of the infected person can spread from people to people and this can actually bring passive immunity and protect the community however in communities with low immunization rates the virus is spread from one unvaccinated child 
to other over a long period of time. And when the immunization rates are low, that means the virus can multiply in the guts. And when multiplication happens, mutation will inevitably happen. And through mutation, it can take a form that can cause paralysis, just like the wild poliovirus. This mutated poliovirus can then spread in communities, leading to circulating vaccine-derived polioviruses. Hence, the cause of circulating vaccine-derived poliovirus is low immunization rate. So the best way to prevent them and to stop them when there's a disease outbreak is to vaccinate children. The polio vaccine protects children whether the kind of polio is wild poliovirus or vaccine-derived poliovirus. Outbreaks are usually rapidly stopped with two to three rounds of high-quality supplementary immunization activities. So let's talk about vaccines. There are two kinds of vaccines available for polio. The most predominant vaccine in use is oral polio vaccine. There are different types of oral polio vaccine and they may contain one or a combination of two or all three different types of or all three serotypes of attenuated vaccine. Attenuated vaccine as you understand contain live virus but they have been deactivated either because of heating or irradiation or some chemical stress or, or through any other form but they have been made less effective but still they are live so they are able to replicate effectively in the intestine but they are around 10,000 times less able to enter the central nervous system. Their infectivity is attenuated. This enables the individuals to mount an immune response against the virus very powerfully. Live attenuated vaccines gives the highest amount of immunity. So all countries that have eradicated polio have used oral polio vaccine. Because it is easy to administer, it is easy to handle, it does not require specialized medical professionals, it does not require injections and syringe, and inherently, it is inexpensive. It is very effective because the immune response is the strongest in case of live attenuated vaccine. It is also safe. It is safe because oral polio vaccine stimulates good mucosal immunity. And this is why it is so effective in interrupting the transmission of the virus. The mucosal immunity increases. And vaccinated children, their guts won't allow the multiplication of virus. So their chances of they leaking out through the stool will also be less. And hence the risk of community spread will also be less. It is administered orally. So it does not require highly skilled health professionals. It does not require a sterile needle or syringes. They are easy to administer and hence they are helpful in mass vaccination campaigns. Also for several weeks after vaccination, the vaccine virus replicates in the intestine and they can be excreted and can be spread to others in close contact. This means that in areas with poor hygiene and sanitation, immunization with oral polio vaccine can result in passive immunization of people who have not been vaccinated. But as I have told you before, everything has a cost. High effectiveness comes with slight compromise on safety. Oral polio vaccine, they are considered to be extremely safe and effective in extreme rare cases. At the rate of approximately 2 to 4 events in 1 million birth, the live attenuated vaccine virus in oral polio vaccine can cause paralysis. In some cases, it is believed that it may be triggered by an immunodeficiency. Also, very rarely though, but when there is insufficient coverage of vaccine in the community, the vaccine virus may be able to circulate and then mutate and then over the course of 12 to 18 months, reacquire the ability to get into the central nervous system. This is what we have discussed in the circulating vaccine-derived poliovirus. This may cause the reappearance of the disease outbreak. The other kind of vaccine is inactivated poliovirus vaccine. Inactivated means killed form of virus. The virus is not alive, so the virus will not multiply. This may also have strains of all three poliovirus types. It is given in the form of injection intramuscular or intradermal injection. So of course it will require a little more trained health workers. Inactivated poliovirus vaccine produces antibodies in the blood. They do not orally go into the intestine or the gut. They go into the bloodstreams. So they create antibodies in the blood. And in the event of infection, these antibodies prevent the spread of the virus from getting inside the central nervous system. Because in case of inactivated poliovirus vaccine, the virus is not live. So there is no risk of vaccine-associated paralytic polio. 
I told you that live attenuated vaccine, they cause highest amount of immune response. But also inactivated virus vaccines, they also trigger an excellent protective immune response in most people. So the effectiveness could be slightly less, but it is very, very safe. There hasn't been any serious adverse reaction that has been shown anywhere in the world following the vaccination of polio in the form of inactivated polio virus vaccine. So IPV is also highly effective in preventing paralytic disease. But the thing is that IPV goes into the bloodstream. So they induce very low level of immunity in the intestine. As a result, when a person immunized with IPV is infected with wild polio virus, the virus can still multiply inside the intestine and be shed into the environment through the fecal material, raising the risk of continued circulation. Also, it is more expensive than OPV. Administration of IPV will require trained health workers as well as the sterile injection equipments and the procedures have to be laid down clearly. See, an increasing number of industrialized polio-free countries, they are using IPV now. IPV is the vaccine of choice. This is because the risk of paralytic polio associated with continued routine use of OPV is deemed greater than the risk of imported wild virus. So circulating vaccine-derived polio virus, if this has to be avoided, then IPV must be used. However, as IPV does not stop transmission of the virus, OPV is used wherever a polio outbreak needs to be contained. Even in countries which rely exclusively on IPV for their routine immunization program. But once polio has been eradicated, use of all OPV will need to be stopped to prevent re-establishment of transmission due to vaccine-derived polio viruses. There's a small news article on page number 10, EPFO plans new pension scheme. The plan of the new pension scheme are for those who have basic monthly income above 15,000 per month. Presently, the EPFO contribution is compulsory for those having monthly income less than rupees 15,000 in organized sector. For more than 15,000, it is optional. But EPFO is planning to come up with a pension scheme for people who have more than rupees 15,000 monthly income in the organized sector. The detail of this scheme is not known yet. So let's talk about EPF, Employee Provident Fund, a little bit. As you would know, it's a social security scheme and it is for salaried individuals. The scheme is run by EPFO. EPFO comes under the Ministry of Labor. The thing is that organizations that employ 20 or more people need to offer Employee Provident Fund benefits to their employee. But it is not compulsory for everyone. Only those who earn less than rupees 15,000 a month, they have to contribute 12% of their basic salary plus their dearness allowances. The employer contributes the equal amount. So the employer also contributes 12% to the employee provident fund of the employee. But out of this 12%, 3.67% goes to EPF. And the rest 8.33% goes to employee's pension scheme. So they'll get pension after their retirement. Who? People earning less than rupees 15,000 a month. But those who earn above the threshold of rupees 15,000, their contribution to EPF is optional. So it is for them that EPFO is contemplating a pension scheme. Taxation on EPF comes under exempt exempt and exempt tax regime. This means that the annual contribution made by the employee is tax deductible up to rupees 1.5 lakh under section 80c of IT Act. So that is for the first exempt. The interest earned on it is also exempted from the tax. So that's the second exempt. And no tax is there on accumulated amount when it is withdrawn. That is the third exempt. Sometime the employer may see this contribution as a burden. And to encourage employment generation, Government of India started Pradhan Mantri Rozgar Prosahan Yojana. Under this scheme, the government was paying 12% of employer contribution to EPFO in respect to new employees drawing salary up to rupees 15,000 a month for the first three years of their employment. But we have to be updated that this scheme has already ended on 31st of March 2019. There's an article on page number six the budget spells green shoot for agri subsectors. See, the discussion on the agriculture sector vis-a-vis -vis the budget or the agriculture subsectors 
have been done in quite detail by Baswa sir in the budget and economic service series of videos. And there isn't anything in this article that has not been already discussed. So to understand the agricultural subsectors and their budgetary allocations and importance given the budget to various sectors of agriculture, you must have either already listened to those videos. In case you have not, you must listen. Agricultural sector has been the focus during the time of COVID because agriculture was the least affected sector because of the pandemic. Agriculture sector registered a robust performance during the COVID-19 pandemic. It has registered growth rate of 4.3% in 2019-20 and 3.6% in 2020-21. For 21-22, the projected growth rate is 3.9%. And because of the decent performance during the time of pandemic, there hasn't been much emphasis given to the agriculture sector in the last budget. Within agriculture, you would know that livestock and fisheries roughly contribute about 33% to the gross value added in the agriculture sector. The Situation Assessment Survey 2019, according to this, more than 15% of income is derived from livestock subsectors. Hence, these two subsectors, livestock and fisheries, did attract attention of the government and decent allocations in the budget. So higher allocation has been done for the schemes like National Livestock Mission, Pradhan Mantri Matsya Sampada Yojana. But on the other hand, the budgetary allocation for Pradhan Mantri Annadata Ai Sanrakshan Abhiyan, PM Asha, has been reduced to just rupees 1 crore. This perhaps has been done because Government of India has made up a committee to look into the issue of MSP. So if MSP would be increased, money will flow from one pocket to the other. Government also has decreased the allocation for MG Narega. The reduction has been huge to the tune of 25%. This perhaps may be because of the data given out by economic survey that the demand of Manrega has decreased on account of improvement in the rural distress as the situation of pandemic is recovering. There are two more important articles in today's newspaper. One is concerning the comprehensive economic partnership agreement between India and UAE and the other article is on Prevention of Money Laundering Act. However, discussion on both the topics have happened in the DNS very recently, within a week. The reference and the link to these discussions are put in the comment section, just in case you need to refer to them. Now you see on your screen the answer to yesterday's question of the day and today's question of the day. Please attempt it, post your answer in the comment section, have some fruitful discussion. Also, for more practice, try and attempt the DNS quiz on the eLearn platform. Goodbye. Take care.